again. Good morning. We've just come through the season of Advent, a season of waiting, a season of anticipation and expectation. You know, we all have our own sort of routines and things of Christmas that we might be waiting on or, or looking forward to. We also realized this year was probably different for most of us. Probably not exactly the same type of family gatherings or church gatherings, uh, uh, office parties, uh, whatever it may be. Even in the shopping and things perhaps was different. But it's a time of waiting. Now in our gospel reading this morning in, in that second chapter of Luke, we come across two characters that make an appearance in sort of what are... Uh, not really the final acts of the Christmas drama, but, you know, we, we tend to cram everything together. Y'all have this most beautiful nativity set here, this crash. And, uh, um, like most all of them, there are wise men there. Now, if we were talking history this morning or chronology, the wise men would be way over there somewhere yet. But there would be a visit to the temple there. And in that temple that morning, there were two people. And they're very much a part of this Christmas drama, but we don't usually see them in our pageants, in our children's activities or things that we do. A man named Simeon, a woman named Anna. I've never seen them on a Christmas card. But they were waiting, same as we wait in Advent. They were waiting for someone. Luke, in recording this, he uses a, a Greek word of anticipation that identifies them as waiting with expectation for the coming of the Messiah or the Savior. It, it literally means that they were alert to His appearance and ready to welcome Him. We see it in verse 25 when Simeon, it says that he was waiting but waiting with anticipation, waiting knowing that this was going to happen, ready to welcome the Christ child. And then later in verse 38, it talks about Anna is also, she's waiting, but it says she's looking forward to. Same thing, she's looking for something particular, for a particular reason. So there was this man in Jerusalem, called Simeon, he was righteous and devout, he was waiting on the consolation of Israel. And it means he was righteous before people, they thought a lot of him. And he was devout in his relationship with God. Now this consolation of Israel, things weren't going real well for the nation of Israel at this point in time. They hadn't really heard from God, not in the manner they were used to, through the prophets and through various things being revealed. They hadn't heard from God for many years. They were living under Roman rule and authority. They had lost most of their political independence. They were living in fear of King Herod and what he would do next. Many had begun to wonder if this Messiah would ever come. Verse 26 shows us that Simeon had good reason for his hope and his anticipation. We're told that the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. But the Holy Spirit also didn't tell him how long that might take. Simeon's expectation focused on the comfort that Christ would bring. Consolation and comfort. Among the Jews of Simeon's day, that was one of the popular titles of the promised Messiah. It was a comfort. They were longing for this Messiah. They were waiting for this one to come to bring comfort to them. Because the desire to be comforted has never changed. The desire to be comforted is a universal human need. We all struggle to be comforted. We struggle with loneliness and emptiness. We struggle with insecurity, sometimes even desperation. And here at Christmas time, Christmas time it's, it's very well documented. We know this. You know, this is one of the major crisis times for people with depression, for people who are prone to self-harm. This is a very tough time of year for people like that. They need comfort and understanding. 
Israel was looking for that. We're also told the Holy Spirit prompted Simeon to go to the temple courts. At just the right time on just the right day that Joseph and Mary were bringing their infant to the temple. Simeon looked at the baby Jesus and he's about six weeks old. You know, these ritual things that they talk about, part of it was the cleansing ritual for Mary and part of it was the dedication of the firstborn. It's supposed to come in 40 days. So he's a couple days short of six weeks old. And Simeon knew God would keep his promise. And now he sees it. Here is Emmanuel, God with us, God with him. The one to make everything right, to provide the significance simply by his presence now on earth. The one who would eliminate this fear and rejection and loneliness. Now I've always thought it's interesting we read that Simeon reached out and took Jesus out of Mary's arms. Began to praise God. Now as parents, we kind of know what that might feel like. We all know what it's like to have an infant or a small child, sometimes even a, even a toddler or something, and, and someone you know, reaches for them or starts, you know, not necessarily out of harm, but it still makes us nervous, especially in this day and age. Even in the church. You know, we're not so welcoming that we would just walk in with our new infant and people come up and start passing him around. So we're not sure how that went at first, but it, 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 it doesn't tell us anything unsettling happened. Even though I think it probably was a little unsettling for Joseph and Mary. I doubt Simeon looked very dangerous. And it was a different time. But also he quickly, it says, quickly broke out in praise. He acknowledged that God had not only fulfilled the individual promise to him, but it also fulfilled the promise of the prophets to send the anointed one to comfort both the Jews and the Gentiles. So what Simeon was waiting on had happened. The other character here waiting with anticipation was Anna. At first she seems very devout but also sort of sad. Her husband has died. She has dedicated herself to fasting and praying in the temple. Scripture says she never left the temple. She worshipped day and night. She was looking forward to this same person that Simeon was, but she had a different reason in mind. She wasn't necessarily looking for comfort. She was looking for forgiveness. Verse 38 says that. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to who all were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Now the word redemption here is related to the idea of captivity. The Old Testament Passover, the release of Israel from captivity and slavery, that stood in Anna's day as the ultimate redemption story. God had redeemed His people. And ultimately the Passover we know points ahead to the day God's going to provide deliverance from the slavery of sin. So when Anna saw Jesus, she gave thanks to God and she spoke to Him. To all who were waiting for redemption, it says. Here at last was the one who would save His people. To us it reminds us that Jesus always provides what we need, folks. When Jesus came to the temple that day, He provided the very thing that Simeon and Anna were waiting on. God's comfort and God's forgiveness. So I'd ask you this question this morning. Over the past several weeks, over the season of Advent, maybe longer than that, given the state of our everything right now, what were you waiting for this Christmas? Whatever it was, I hope you got it. I hope you found it. Or perhaps you're still waiting. But the message of Christmas, the message of that birth is that Jesus can give it to you. However you frame it, however you verbalize it, whatever it is you're needing now, the answer is Jesus can give it to you. 
Maybe you identify a little bit with Simeon today. Maybe you're hurting right now, feeling some loneliness, empty, afraid. You're done with this virus and all its death and all its damage and all its disruption. We're done with it. We want things, I don't like to say back to normal, but we want things more like they ought to be. Things more readily available to be normal. Do you need some comfort or consoling? Do you need a fresh sense of God's presence? If so, you can find what you're looking for in that Christ child, in Jesus. Because He indeed came to console us all. And He came to do it right where we're at. Simeon was where he was at. Anna was where she was at. We're where we are. But it's the same Christ. Maybe you identify with Him. Maybe you're seeking some sort of forgiveness or redemption, some sort of renewal. Maybe dealing with some guilt or anxiety, a lot of anxiety with people this Christmas. Because of something you've done or something you didn't do. Maybe you feel like you're trapped in a pattern you can't break out of. If we need forgiveness, if we need redemption, if we need uplifting, Jesus offers that today. And I want to share just three real quick examples from this passage this morning that I think can help us experience this comfort and experience this forgiveness, this redemption, this renewal. The first is that marvel I talked about, marvel and redemption. Become a marveler again. Now that's a, a funny word, but when's the last time you stood in awe of God? When's the last time you stood in awe of that miracle that was the baby Jesus? You know, it says when Mary and Joseph tried to process everything that was happening, they marveled at what was said about Jesus. He's 40 days old. We know all they had already been through and all they were still wrapping their minds around him. But when they were told this, it says they marveled. Now according to the dictionary, to be a marveler is to be filled with wonder and astonishment and surprise. You know, this year was a lot different for Christmas because of the pandemic, but it's still Christmas in our day and age and it's become too predictable. It's too familiar. You know, have you heard the Christmas story so many times that it no longer astonishes you? It's a very paradoxical time of the year for us. It's an annual celebration of Christmas, but sometimes because we're just doing the same things, we're going through the motions, we can be immunized to its reality. You know, maybe we hear just enough of the story each year that it sort of inoculates us against the real thing. Maybe we're not really catching the true Christmas spirit. I was very interested last week, a week or so ago, on December 21st, you know, we had the Christmas star. Now, I don't know how many of you saw it because like where I live, it's cloudy. And on one hand, I was really excited about that because anybody that knows me or the people in my previous church could tell you when I lived out in Boone's Mill, I, I was blessed to live where it was dark. So I could see the sky at night. And many was the time, you know, I'd be out there after midnight just wandering around the yard looking at the sky. So I wanted to see this alignment of planets and things also. But I was amazed at all the hoopla. I was amazed at the news stories and all the various things I read on social media. And part of me was very excited people were interested. And some were even equating this to the Christmas story and reading scripture and talking about it. But I was also saddened by it. You know, it only happens once every 800 years or so, they say. But as Christians, as believers, as those already redeemed, shouldn't we be excited about the Christmas star in that manner every year? Whether we really get to see it or not, I didn't get to see it this year. I guess I have to wait 800 and something more years. Simeon wasn't waiting out of sadness. He was waiting out of anticipation. We need to marvel at God again. We need to marvel at Christ again. 
The second is about moving, to be a mover. It said in verse 27, Simeon was moved by the Spirit to go to the temple courts. And then when it talks about Anna, it says coming up to them at that very moment. Both Simeon and Anna were movers. When the Holy Spirit prompted them to move, they didn't sit still. They didn't question. They moved. They act. Actually, all the Christmas characters, all of the ones down here in your beautiful scene, were movers. Mary was ready to move when she said to the angel, May it be as to me as you have said. Joseph demonstrated he was a mover when he woke up from his dream and he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded of him. And he took Mary home to be his wife. Those shepherds, those lowly shepherds we talk about so much, they were movers. You know, after the angel did their thing, the, the shepherds didn't take a vote or take a discussion or question what they should do. It said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened. The wise men saw that very star or something similar we were talking about. Some alignment of the planets and something that told them something was happening. And through their knowledge of the stars and through their knowledge of ancient scripture that wasn't even their people's, but they knew it. You know, there's a whole other sermon there. There's people out there that know our scriptures better than we know it. And they're looking at us and wondering why we're not living it out. But they moved. Church, when God prompts you to do something, then you need to do it. Maybe the Spirit's trying to move you this Christmas. Maybe they, the Spirit wants you to be more involved in something or to do something different or to try something different. You know, a lot of times we sense something and we're not sure what it is. Well, just be the Christian you proclaim to be and say, well, that must be the Holy Spirit. And move. Don't procrastinate when God prompts you to do something because you might miss out on a miracle. And you might miss out on being the opportunity to be someone else's miracle. We, we look at what Simeon told Mary and it, it had to take her breath away. This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel. Be a sign that will be spoken against. Now to us, if we think about it, that's not a real joyful Christmas greeting. He's not saying Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. He's pausing, clearing his throat, and telling her that Christmas will never be merry and New Year will never be happy until people get moving and surrender themselves to the Christ. Because the birth of that child split people into two camps. Jesus entered the world and divided the human race. The falling and the rising of many. That's what Jesus came to do. It forces people to make a decision about it. There's powerful imagery all throughout Scripture about that, but the most simplest is, you know, Jesus is either the rock that you build your life upon, the rising, or He's the rock that you stumble over, the falling. You have to make that choice. Christmas reminds us that Jesus is calling each of us, and based upon our willingness to move and respond, we're either going to rise or we're going to fall. You can't stay neutral about Jesus. You're either for Him or against Him. You're either moving closer to Him and with Him or further away. And then the final thing here is about being a messenger. Or being a witness. There again in verse 38 talking about Anna. It said she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. We need to become marvelers. We need to marvel and be astonished and be astounded by God every day. That's the wonder of Christmas. And we need to live it out every day. And when we do that, we ought to be moving. We ought to be paying attention to the Holy Spirit. And if we take those roles seriously, then we will garner our role as a messenger seriously. We'll be in a position to introduce others to the Christ of Christmas. So that they in turn can find what they've been missing. My final question to you this Christmas season before you pack all these things up. Is do you know people who get caught up in the preparations for Christmas. But somehow they miss the meaning and the message of Christmas. Because that meaning and message is marvelous. It's moving. It's forgiving and it's life saving. 
and we proclaim we found it. We gather to celebrate it every Sunday and, and Wednesdays and any time we talk and share. So how can we be quiet about it? How can we not want others to know it? Christmas is the birthday of Jesus. It's His part. But we know, we know He wanted to give us a present, and He has. Or at least we think we know. We have to be honest with ourselves. He wants to give you the gift of Himself. Will you take Him? And then when you do, will you share Him? Merry Christmas.